Where can incredible artifacts be found? Almost anywhere in the world. What do incredible artifacts look like? Almost anything. There's no hard and fast guide to what makes for an incredible artifact, but we certainly know one when we see one. Whenever we see one, we want to make sure you see it too. That's why we make fantastic fact-filled videos like this one, and we hope you enjoy it. To some archaeologists, especially those with an interest in the Bible, the Gabriel Stone is the most important archaeological discovery since the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, some archaeologists even say that it's effectively a Dead Sea Scroll inscribed into stone. The three-foot-tall stone tablet was found on the shores of the Dead Sea back in the year 2000 and is also known as the Gabriel Revelation Stone because of its inscription. The text is barely legible after thousands of years exposed to the elements, but it provides a first-person narrative ostensibly delivered by the biblical archangel Gabriel. Unusual for artifacts of the time, which is thought to be approximately 2,100 years ago, the inscriptions have been overlaid in ink after being carved into the stone. What's even more unusual are the messages contained in the narrative. At one point it says, I am Gabriel. In three days, the sign will be given. By three days, return to life. I, Gabriel, command you. I am the prince of princes, the dung of rocky crevices. This appears to be a written record of Gabriel commanding the dead to return to life. But who and why? It's thought to be around a century too old to be related to Christ, so who else did Gabriel bring back from the dead? Most of you will be familiar with the concept of a time capsule. For those who aren't, it's a record of the present day made by putting present day objects in a box or other container and then burying them for somebody else to find in the future. The idea became wildly popular as an activity for school children in the late 20th century, but its origins are far older. In May 2021, a time capsule from 1876 was found during renovation work at a Catholic primary school in Barrow, England. The capsule, which is a glass jar, was placed inside the foundation stone of the school's chapel, suggesting that it had been created deliberately at the time the school and chapel were built. After carefully opening the jar, staff from the school found that it contained coins from the era and a rolled-up newspaper from the day the stone was laid. This adds to the history of the building, which is believed to be the only United Reformed Church school in the entire world. Having unearthed this blast from the past, the school's children have replaced the jar with one of their own. Perhaps someone else will find it in another 145 years. If we told you that a stunning ancient Roman fresco had been found, you'd probably assume the discovery happened in Rome, or at least in Italy. That's not always the case. The Roman Empire conquered half the world, and they left stunning art wherever they went. This particular fresco was found in London, England during preparation work for the construction of a new office block at 21 Lime Street. Archaeologists and experts on Roman history believe this to be a first century fresco which would make it one of the earliest surviving examples of its kind in the country. The design is highly unusual for the region. Frescoes that look like this have been seen before in Roman villas in Germany, but never in England. The only reason this one has survived is that it fell face down when the building that once contained it was flattened to make way for the Second Forum Basilica during the second century. It probably once had pride of place in a grand reception room, where Roman hosts would greet and entertain their guests. Now, 2,000 years later, it's going to take pride of place in a museum. Speaking of the ancient Romans, they were known to be big fans of board games. They might even have invented the game that went on to become chess. You might have heard of the Roman game Ludus Lantricolorum before, but in November 2014, a different variation of it was discovered in the ancient Turkish city of Kibira. It's called Ludus Dotusum Scriptorium. All that's left of the old game set after 1800 years in the ground are two game pieces and a square stone board. Its name translates into English roughly as the game of 12 written lines, 
although where written lines comes into it is unknown. In form and function, it's likely to have been similar to backgammon and evolved from an even older Roman board game called Senate. Playing it with a friend would have been considered a fine way of passing the time in the city's agoras. It might even still be fun to play if anybody knew the rules, but sadly, they've been lost to time. We know that it once involved 15 pieces and was played with three dice, but how the dice drove the movement of the pieces is a mystery. Okay, so maybe we lied about the whole moving on from Scotland thing? There are just too many wonderful Scottish things to look at. Another great example is St. Andrew's Sarcophagus. According to experts, this Pictish monument was created during the latter half of the 8th century, after which it was lost and forgotten until it was found during excavations at St. Andrew's Cathedral in Fife in 1833. It isn't entirely in one piece, but the pieces of it that we have are beautiful. The whole sarcophagus would have featured decorated panels on all four sides, along with a roof slab and corner pieces. But the sarcophagus as it exists today is missing its roof slab, the top panel, and one of the corner pieces. The scenes depicted on the sides of the sarcophagus include a man breaking a lion's jaw, another man attacking a jumping lion with a sword, and two men hunting wolves. It's possible that the man portrayed in the scenes is the person who was once buried within the sarcophagus. It's also possible that the man in question was Angus, a Pictish king who died in 761, but it was empty when it was found, so it'll never be possible to verify that theory. We've all heard of the idea of burying a time capsule for people of the future to discover. Perhaps you've even planted one yourself because a 126-year-old time capsule was uncovered by construction workers in the Scottish Highlands hamlet of Kingasy in 2015. It appears that some of our forefathers had similar thoughts. The shoebox-sized capsule looks to have been buried on purpose, with the September 1894 newspaper inside to establish the date, a bottle of whiskey, and a parchment scroll was also present. Because the whiskey bottle is still sealed, it's theoretically safe to drink, but no one has tried it yet. The capsule was located beneath an old bridge that was being ripped out and replaced at the time the capsule was discovered. There was an even older bridge here before the one that the workers were tearing down, and the find dates to that time. It would have been used by horses rather than cars at the time of the burial. It's an enthralling glimpse at the lives of ordinary workers in Scotland's past. Just because an old relic is on show in a museum doesn't guarantee the museum understands what the ancient object is. That's the situation with the National Museum of Scotland's Balakulish Idol. When we say it's an antique figurine of some kind, we're stating the obvious. But no one knows who made it or why. The only thing we know for sure is that it was carved some 2,500 years ago. It's more likely to be a female representation than a male, based on the body shape and the pebble stones in its face are most likely supposed to be eyes. During the 1880s, the figurine was unearthed by chance in a peat bog. The best technique to preserve things discovered in peat was less well understood back then than it is now. The idol was removed from the site too soon and therefore left to dry out, resulting in cracking and warping. It doesn't look terrible for something that's over 2,000 years old, but it was much nicer when it first emerged from the muck. Most scholars believe it's a sculpture of Calic Bethir, a Celtic hag deity of winds and storms, but that's just a well-informed guess. During the Iron Age, she was revered in various regions of Scotland. Okay, we are really leaving Scotland now. In fact, we're going back to Sweden to check out the Tiska Kirken weather vane. It's in the Swedish capital city of Stockholm, although you'll no longer find it on top of a building. It's kept safely indoors now, after it was very nearly destroyed in a fire. The weather vane was once atop the old town's German church, and had been ever since the church was erected to serve Stockholm's rapidly growing German population in 1672. The German portion of the city started with a school, a guild, and the church, 
but later expanded way beyond that and still exists today. Just over 200 years later, in 1878, the church caught fire and almost totally burned to the ground. It had to be rebuilt in its entirety, but somehow the massive brass weather vane remained unharmed. There was no reason why the old weather vane couldn't be attached to the roof of the new church once construction work was complete, but planners decided to get a new one instead. The original is now inside the church's entrance hall, protected by a glass case. Being a desert nomad could get boring 4,000 years ago. People needed to find a way of passing the time during the long nights in the Azerbaijani desert, so they came up with a board game. Their board game was a little larger in scale than the humble game of Monopoly you might play with your family and friends today. They drilled large holes into the ground within a rock shelter in what's now Gabustan National Park. It took modern-day archaeologists a very long time to work out what the holes were, but it's now widely accepted that they were used to play a game called 58 Holes, which is also known as Hounds and Jackals. The game was popular throughout the ancient world, and especially so in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Antonolia. A miniature version of it was even found inside the tombs of Tutankhamun. We can identify the game through the arrangement of the holes, but we still don't know how it was played. It's possible that it may have been similar to backgammon, with stones used as counters, but it's equally as possible that it was nothing like backgammon at all. Music is played and loved all over the world, and has been for thousands of years. But different types of musical instruments have been popular in different places at different times. We imagine that all of you will have seen a trombone before, but you've probably never seen one that looks like this. It's called a nagpani, and there's a particularly fine, well-preserved example of one in the collection of the Met Museum in New York City, USA. Nagpanis were played by Sagara, a specialized type of professional musician from Northwest India. These snake-like instruments were played almost exclusively at weddings or other such ceremonial, sociable occasions and are still in use in some parts of the rural Indian Northwest today. They reached the peak of their popularity in the late 19th century. The proper classification of an instrument like this is an aerophone lip-vibrated trumpet, but Nagfani is obviously a much catchier name. The unusual design of the instrument isn't optimal for a wind instrument, so it takes a particularly gifted musician with very powerful lungs to play it correctly. Any artifact from the Pictish culture, an ancient Scottish civilization, is likely to be a mystery. The Picts are a culture about whom we know very little, not even their name. We only identify them as Picts because that's how the Romans referred to them, and it's considered a derogatory term. The Rhiney Man is one of the most important and fascinating Pictish relics. In 1978, a six-foot-tall monument depicting a man in a headdress carrying an axe was discovered in Aberdeenshire. Scientists believe the stone was cut in the 5th or 6th centuries while accepting the fact that dating stone is difficult. Because the spot it was excavated in was a graveyard for high-status Pictish people, it's possible that the individual whose likeness is chiseled into the stone was a notable person, maybe a tribe leader. He's wielding a Pictish-style axe comparable to those used in animal sacrifices. Although there's no proof of this, it's possible that the slab was also used in animal sacrifices. Equally, it could just have been decoration for the entrance to a fort that formerly stood on this location. Were the first immigrants to America members of a long-lost Israelite tribe? That's what the so-called Newark Holy Stones imply. And those who believe the stones are genuine take the suggestion very seriously. An archaeologist called David Wirick allegedly discovered the artifacts inside ancient Native American burial mounds near Newark, Ohio in 1860. He discovered the keystone, the Decalogue, and a stone bowl in that order. The Johnson Humrick House Museum in Ohio now has all three items. 
The Newark Earthworks, where the disputed objects were discovered, were built by the Hopewell culture upwards of 1,500 years ago, according to popular belief. The Hebrew inscription on the keystone, which includes terms like Holy of Holies, seems incongruous. A tiny Hebrew inscription of the Ten Commandments was later found inside the Decalogue. We should note that Wirick was a proponent of the theory that America was founded by a lost tribe of Israel long before he apparently discovered this evidence, and that the Hebrew used in the inscriptions is contemporary rather than ancient. It's probably a ruse perpetrated by Wirick, and not a particularly cunning one at that. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.